I'm Mark Seifter. And I'm Linda Zeiss Palmer. And this is Arcane Mark. Hi folks, and welcome to GM Tools One Shots. That's right. Today we're going to be talking about, very specifically, one shot, one and done games. Mark, what is a one shot? Well, as opposed to an ongoing campaign where you play uh, characters who are persistent and in between adventures they level up and gain more items and you're always playing that same character and sort of developing that character and learning more about that character's story and narrative arc. Or a periodic game like Pathfinder Society, which is made up of a series of singleton games that you kind of make your own story with, but still have a persistent character. A one-shot game is a game where you get in, you play it with that character, and that's it. You're never going to see that character again, more or less. That plotline is just done with. And it's meant to just sort of be entertainment for one night or one session or one event. That's mm -hmm. a one shot. That's why it's called one shot. Yeah. Um, but it means it's a one off. Yeah. I would say that a one shot, like, you could have a, something that I'd still kind of think of as very similar to a one shot that ran over two short sessions. It's not necessarily the... The fact that it's one night sure. that is the pure definition but the idea that it's a small a small encapsulated experience and sebastian points out that linda's new maelstrom maelstrom rift path on a steady mm -hmm. scenario was essentially a one shot because those characters have never shown up ever again and we're just doing their own thing and says to bring back the pyrosta dragon from that <laughs> one i'm glad i convinced you to include a pyrosta he's so cute <laughs> I, to be fair, it didn't take that much convincing. I know, but I, but I was like, but it's a Pyrosta. You're like... And you were like, that's not really an elemental, though. Yeah. I was like, but look at them. They're the smallest dragons in the game. Mm -hmm. And all the editors were like, oh, when I, when they read the line about their tiny heart giving mm -hmm. out. Because I also wrote the that monster for Best Series 5. So and then you were like, but what, what would it do if it, it's yeah. like so much lower level than them? I was like, it could be a bard. Yep. <laughs> and then you were sold immediately. Yep. Yeah, well, it doesn't take that hard. You used argument from cuteness, which is a pretty effective strategy when convincing me to do things. Yes. Add <laughs> cuter recordium. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah. That is a scenario that I ran just sort of on emergency at one point uh, at a convention that we were at, mm -hmm. and it was great. It was fantastic. Well, I was supposed to run it, and then I got sick, so yep. you picked up the you table You were super me. sick, um, and I just ran it, and it was easy to run, and the characters were great, and there were some people who had just actually, I think, um, or that they played it, and then they either just before or after were playing the trilogy that was sort of connected to the... the mm -hmm. Jenny, who was in there, and they they got really excited by everything. The best part was that the person who was just like, oh, I won't pick. I'll just take whatever one is last, left over at the end is the one who got, like, the most excited about their character at the <laughs> end. So it was, it was good. Um, so, but getting into this story about how, how great <laughs> Linda's one-shot of Through Maelstrom Rift was, which, for those of you who have not played it, you should, mm -hmm. even if you don't usually play Pathfinder First Edition. But it's a it's a one shot where a um, an elementally conscious organization gathers together um, a a Pyrausta bard, definitely the Mephit Arcanist that they asked for, mm -hmm. um, Water Mephit, for sure. Uh, Jenny, a um, a. Sylph Sky Druid, who's yes. from a world that was destroyed, mm -hmm. and an Oread Inquisitor of an uh, an evil elemental Lord of Earth, and they all you're forgetting uh, someone oh, important. I'm forgetting someone important. You're Wait. forgetting you're you're forgetting the Thokwa Barbarian. Say? Oh, the Thokwa Barbarian, who's <laughs> learned to speak. <laughs> yes, of yes. course. Uh, She's re she is a she <laughs> is a consummate craftswoman who has refined her. Uh, who who who's refined her armor by by uh, modifying her diet? The dragon and the falcon would be a very effective team of teen detectives. 
So they all team up and are an unlikely grouping that is pretty elementally balanced, mm -hmm. too, because the method is a water method. Um, so this sort of, by example of someone who is an expert in creating adventures that are roughly the length of a one-shot, and in this case was a one-shot, mm -hmm. shows you something that you want to do from most one-shots, which is Make you should probably build pre-generated characters for them. You can do a one-shot where people just bring their own characters, but that is usually not the best way to do a one-shot mm -hmm. because people who... It takes so long for them to build their character and they get invested, but it's a one-shot. But more importantly... When you're building a one-shot, you can build the pre-generated characters to be sure that they each have something interesting to offer in that one-shot. Because yeah. you're the one who wrote it. Because so, it, Yeah, because a one-shot story really needs to, to be able to stand on its own. And it has more of a sense of, like, that it, it should really bring those characters in. Because then why, why didn't you just do it as a side story as a part of your other characters? with other characters that you have. Plus, one-shots let you do all sorts of things that you wouldn't necessarily want to do in a long-running campaign. Um, they let you have things that are more dangerous or ways that than people might necessarily want to have usually. They let you um, they let you play with expectations. Like, one of the one-shots that I played in with you um, started with a grand battle, and it felt to us initially that this was a, that this was a battle adventure and we were just going to try to see how long we could survive. But really, the true adventure started when everyone died and went to Valhalla. But like, if we if we hadn't known that was a one, if we if it hadn't been a one shot, you wouldn't have been able to pull that off because we would have known that like something else had to happen after that. Yep. And also, when Linda says played him with you, she means I was running it and yes. she was playing it. Mm -hmm. But um, the main the main idea though is that you can control a lot of aspects of a one shot that an ongoing campaign you can't. For instance. If someone has the barkeep background mm -hmm. and has alcohol lore, like, maybe that will be really important or come up in your ongoing campaign. Maybe it won't. Maybe they'll try to find a way. But if you write a one-shot, you know that alcohol lore turns out to be a really important skill, for instance. If you did make it be an important skill, then you can have someone who knows about alcohol. You can have characters who fulfill the different roles um, in the adventure. For example, I wrote a one-shot for three characters called Burn the Witch, Mm -hmm. Where people played a common, or, or sorry, an aristocrat, an expert, and a, a warrior, which are NPC classes from Pathfinder First Edition that are very bad mm -hmm. at being classes. Except for that, they also had a, uh, and so like the warrior and the aristocrat, the aristocrat was the warrior's fiance, and mm -hmm. the expert was the warrior's best friend who was the innkeeper. And the warrior was the constable, and, and the um, the aristocrat was the mayor's daughter. Mm -hmm. But, like, they each had secrets that they were keeping from each other, and a, a lot of them knew about this hidden shack in the woods that they thought that they were the only person who knew about that they were yep. using for their sketchy reasons, and that they kept getting panicked when people were getting towards that location. <laughs> So we were all, we all had our own secret plots that we were trying to do without informing other people the, and a reason why we didn't want The constable wanted to get married to the Baron's daughter, who was there and was hiding in the shack of the woods because the people had seen her and thought that that was the witch and mm -hmm. he didn't want her to get caught. And the innkeeper was secretly this poison smuggler that the constable had been trying to find for years and never found and used that shack in the woods to smuggle poison. Mm -hmm. that he thought that nobody knew about. And Linda's character was a different witch than the witch that they were looking for, who was training in witchcraft with her mentor <laughs> in that shack in the woods. <laughs> um, and so there was a lot of hijinks involving um, different situations where the players like did not realize the different people that they were seeing were the other players' characters, and I was <laughs> using chat to um, communicate with everyone. And... Um, the point is, the more connected into the adventure, the better the one shot can be. And you can't really do that if you don't write the pre-generated character. And another thing with that too, specifically, is to not, it's not even just the connecting into the adventure, it's connecting with each other as well. That's because right. Because with the one shot, you don't really have the time to slowly build up relationships between characters. So establishing what those relationships and opinions are going to be up front 
or at the very least giving some strong suggestions about like these are the things you know about this person and what your general disposition is and then they can fill in some of the blanks but so that you know that people can expect that other character to react to them in certain ways and that way they can jump right into the action that's right saying what they know about the other characters and making sure it lines up so at least if people read it they know that mm -hmm. is super useful and it helps you give a little bit of a secret goal. And, you know, for some RPGs, maybe people can make their own characters because they're very simplistic. But a lot of the time, it's still fun to have story elements mm -hmm. that, um, that you've designed specifically for the one-shot. So maybe then you come up with the... Maybe you come up with a thing where it's like, okay, you know, this character is a level three fighter who has this general story and if they want to customize from there it doesn't really matter for the story like what their fighting style is but it does matter certain aspects like you're right. a level three fighter your background is this and here's some things about you and your friends and stuff like that right exactly and it's also a one shot is a great time to play a different game system than you usually play mm -hmm. for example some game systems are actually pretty rotten for anything except for a one shot but can be good for a one shot especially some of the more horror focused ones that pretty much kill you um, very quickly or make you lose your mind or other things like that mm -hmm. work better as a one shot because you already know that that character is gone at the end of the session so it's just a question of when mm -hmm. um, even if you make it through to the end your storyline is just well and they made it through to the end as opposed to losing an ongoing character in those systems. Mm -hmm. But even if you play in a system that you know and are familiar with it's a good time to put a twist on it. Like for example um, some of the games that um, that I've offered at PaizoCon and that are available for people um, for, who have a very large amount of experience points on Arcade Mark um, include games where you play as monster characters like the one Linda wrote for Pathfinder Society. So mm -hmm. there's Twilight Bell, which is all full of uh, fae and fairy dragon and a unicorn and a leshy. Um, and then there's um, the Unreality Incursion where... A, um, an unlikely team up where an Archon, an Aeon, an Angel, and a Zata, a Demon, and a Devil are forced to team up to try to protect reality from breaking. So, uh, so you can really get into the types of characters that are that you wouldn't normally see as a chance to experience the other side of things. And maybe that inspires you for another campaign or a longer story arc. There was another one that um, that we did that was with uh, was it Mutants and Masterminds that we did the what the which the, one the underlying game system for the TV Tropes game. Uh yes, the yeah. TV Tropes so the game TV was, Tropes was game Mutants and Masterminds. We actually played it over three sessions. Yeah. it was over three sessions, but I, I guess I guess it still feels a little bit in that one shotty category to me. It though. was. They, they were definitely throwaway characters. Yeah, where where bas the basic premise of that is that um, each player like randomly rolled several tropes on tv tropes and on then the page where you on click the page where you click random trope and then um i think that it gives you a random page and then yeah. you wind up having like to, to do, like, do it do until it, it's a yeah. trope and not a show yes exactly um, so we did a random page or whatever yeah. and then we and then it was like it was like five tropes and then it's like For, pick three tropes yeah and then it was like we pick three tropes and then mark makes the character out of that and then comes up with the story that's right so like, that, that was, was that. that was a very interesting one. They wound up with tropes that sort of fit for a fairy tale setting. Uh, definitely the best one in that one shot was the person who had the "I didn't know I could swim" trope, which is the trope of like the character's skills not being established until suddenly they're used mm -hmm. and not explained to the viewers and even seemingly confusing to the character. For which I gave a character sheet that just had the names of all of the skills in the game with a plus question mark. Mm -hmm. And I had my own version of the sheet with the actual bonus. And then I named all the superpowers that I made up and explained whether they were like a reaction or took your turn, mm -hmm. but nothing else mm -hmm. uh, about them. And then just so was like, what do you want to do? Uh, and, and the player's like, I don't know. I guess I'll use um, not in front of the yeah. children. <laughs> yeah. And then they eventually figured out that not in front of the children forced people to do non-lethal damage and they couldn't swear or other mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, whereas the one, the unicorns with rainbow manes summoned unicorns. Yep. Uh, that was, there is, was obvious. Yeah. There is, so it, it was interesting too though because that's an example of a, a story element that works because it was a one-shot really well. Because so much of that character's role was we don't know and we're discovering how, how things work. Also, once they, which they did not figure out, but if it had been an ongoing campaign, 
figuring out that one of that character's ability was basically wish at will with with some minor limitations um, to just cause reality to become whatever the character believed it to be, um, then it would have been pretty degenerate. But mm -hmm. since the player didn't know that's what it did, it's mm -hmm. like, I'm activating this ability because uh, there's a locked treasure chest and your person who can open it is unconscious. What are you even going to do? I'm going to use this ability. I was like, all right. So what do you expect to happen when you use that ability? He's mm -hmm. like, well, I guess I'll open the treasure chest. <laughs> so I was like, all right, yeah, you go and you use that and you open the treasure chest. And it worked because it was altering reality so that the character could open the treasure chest. Um, so there are definitely a lot of fun ways you can um, subvert things in one shots or just do something really random like Fighter Squad mm -hmm. uh, versus the Throne of Chaos by one shot that is based off of the idea of a 90s arcade game that was based off of an 80s, a hypothetical 80s cartoon show called Fighter Squad vs. the Throne of Chaos, where a bunch of fighters in different colors with different swords fight against chaos. <laughs> yeah, but I think that what this really gets to is that one-shots are a really cool place to play with to play around with new mechanics, too, even if you're not going fully into another game system. If you're wondering, like, hey, I want to try out mythic rules. I want to try out like this. I want to try out this. Uh, I want to try out this variant system from Game Master Guide. I want to try out this other sort of thing that I'm not sure if I want that necessarily to be in my campaign full time or I want to try out something like I want to try out a world that's really low magic compared to what I usually play or I want to try it in a world that's super high magic or I want to try out something that's super high level. It's a chance to, it's really a chance to say okay we're gonna we're gonna do a break from the norm and, and to experiment and learn more about what your group likes so you definitely check out variant rules the game master guide has them unchained has them for pathfinder first edition you can make your own um but yeah ho ho try homebrewing something weird for mm -hmm. the one shot and it, c it can be up power or down power like the one where everyone was playing npc classes that i was talking about before Another really great thing about one-shots, just for the perspective of, of having them available, is that if you have one-shots in your group, you can... That's a... that's a Now, they're definitely more work per session than an ongoing campaign. Yeah, because you have to make sure. those perfect pre-gens. But, but if you do have, like, if you do have, say, you know, somebody in your group who would like to jam, but they don't have time for a full campaign, a one-shot can be a great sort of thing for them to, to plug in and do. And a way to switch things up. Mm-hmm. Stump Monkey suggested sneakily making a one-shot using chase cards, social combat cards, and critical cards as something wild and different, but it was uh, really to see which ones they like to incorporate into the main <laughs> game. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can totally test things out that way. Hey. And um, Sebastian suggests a one-shot with anime turned up to 11. You could definitely do that. Mm -hmm. I definitely, during the time I was considering which one-shots to make, like, had an idea for a one-shot that was, like, kineticist of different elements that was based off of the setting of Avatar The Last Airbender. I never did that one. Mm -hmm. I did do one called First World Problems, where you go to the River Kingdoms and deal with this weird fey situation. And mm -hmm. one that was just sort of a puzzle game called Anagnoresis that you are solving puzzles. Um... Or a, you're solving a bad situation, which turns out mm -hmm. to be like a big giant puzzle, where you and um, you and three other people are trapped in this weird big, or actually in a closet at first, but then this mm -hmm. weird big mansion that's and spooky, you have to figure out what's going on. You have to on. figure yeah. out what's going on. One shots, yeah, definitely, they're a great fit for a convention. Yep. One shots yeah, like, are basically what Paizo staffers run at conventions. Either mm -hmm. that or just like some segment on an adventure they wrote that is like, play this with the author. It's cool because we wrote it. Mm -hmm. uh, that Those two are like very, very high percentage of the types of things that you'll see. So where, do you, where would you say that um, demos fit in relative to, okay. to one-shots? So a demo is pretty different than a one-shot, and it's probably its own episode. Yeah. But a demo is is not exactly a one-shot, but usually the, what you will use for a demo turns out to be a one-shot that is even shorter than a one-shot and is meant to sort of 
what at the appetite of someone who doesn't know anything about this maybe doesn't even know about rpgs and sort of serve like tutorials in video games where they're like you don't want to read this documentation unless you're mark mm -hmm. so instead play this little tutorial level where we slowly introduce different concepts of the game to you and those are sort of those are sort of what demos are yeah i think they, that, that that makes me think that they would be worth another episode because i was going to say we could yes. talk here about the some of the fundamental differences between them and a standard one shot but but you have to sort of design a demo very carefully mm -hmm. To do very particular things, and I know it's thing. It's something that's come up in in even in the office where like, uh, with the pregens that we had in the playtest demos, were not mm -hmm. the same versions of the iconics that Pathfinder Society wanted to have in Pathfinder Society because they were not meant to be able to play a wide range of different adventures. They were meant to literally be a tutorial to the new edition that showed off certain things at certain times in a very very curated way and so because they had different design goals the correct choice was different between them especially mm -hmm. mauriciel and we can talk a little bit about why those two mauriciels were different if we do a demo episode yeah i think we should add that to the list of because demos Demos can be both about constructing sort of published demos for adventures, but also just in terms of an expanded thing about introducing new players to your game and what kind of short adventures are good to run for that. Stunt Monkey says, don't be like The Witcher 2 and put the hardest content at the very start. You know, I played a little bit of the beginning of The Witcher 2 and it was not that hard, but I felt like I didn't understand anything because people told me, you can play number two, one is not as good, don't play one, you don't need it for context. But I felt lost, so I went back to try to play one. And then it wasn't as good, and they were right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it didn't seem like it was that bad. Was it particularly hard compared? Uh, no, but I mean, Witcher 1 had parts that were a lot harder than the beginning yeah, of Witcher 2. Yeah, but you're not like the average, the, you're not averagely experienced yeah, with I'm games. not comparing it to a different person. I'm comparing it to myself playing Witcher 1. There were sections yeah. that were pretty hard. Um, I never got to the end of that, though, because I got bored. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And there, there's a great example here that we be, the Weeby Goblin scenarios are a fun one shot, but they're not good for uh, they're not good for demo purposes because they're not this fundamentally the same content. Bingo, which is also sort of something that is a question of what you do on a free RPG day. Mm -hmm. Is free RPG day supposed to be a demo? Because if it is, that's different than sort of a, a mm -hmm. fun one-shot. Is it supposed to be a fun one-shot that's a little more in-depth, but a little less of a demo or tutorial? Uh, I don't know. So uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. Let's see. People are saying the first part of Witcher 2 requires a lot of combat expertise. Maybe I wasn't playing on a hard enough mode. I don't know. It felt like there. I, it's been a while. But it felt you also like there don't were, think that Dark Souls is that hard, so. I mean, it, Dark Souls <laughs> kills, kills me a lot. It's just not. It wasn't that. People, I think, upplay games like Dark Souls that are meant to kill you and say that they're a hard one when it's meant to be is like it's a game you're supposed to die a lot. But The Witcher wasn't even killing me. I was killing the the dudes that were running around at me at the beginning. Squirrel. Yep, yep. <laughs> Anywho. Dark Souls is a wiki game. You're supposed to do well if you know your stuff. See, Linda, if you just don't just run off into the catacombs like me for no reason, then I'm sure Dark Souls is fine. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we were talking about one shots. Yep. Where were we? We're oh, we were talking about how demos are not the same. Uh, yeah, that would be cool. Of different non-core ancestry each year, so it's not just yeah. the goblins. Who we're get talking all about the one shot goblins, is not the yeah. same as a demo because a demo is. A very specific type of one shot that has a very specific purpose that's different than a usual one shot. A usual one shot is more of a like, let's try this thing that's a little bit different and that is very integrated. And there are some mm -hmm. people who really, I, I should add, who really don't like one shots because you don't have the continuity. And there's some people who adore them. One of our players, um, who was the same one we've talked about in the Kingmaker episodes, who kept changing his character wanted to play only one shots for mm -hmm. a while and other than it was burning me out to keep having to write all of the new characters for each one shot we tried to do it for a little while 
mm -hmm. um, in our group, but it just was not sustainable because uh, if you're a GM who's good at improvising, you don't have to put like that many hours of your life into each session. But you do if you're writing a one-shot and it's super tightly integrated with all of the characters. Yeah. Well, and I think uh, one of the cool things about one-shots, too, is that there's not really one formula for building a one-shot. You don't have to have, like, a... You don't have to have a, a sense of, like, you know, this is going to have this type of encounter, this type of encounter, and whatever. You don't have necessarily have to have a balanced structure. You could easily have a one-shot that's all social intrigue or one-shot that's all combat or one-shot that's all an investigation without needing to without needing to blend things together. You can really tailor it closely to the interests of your group as well. Because, like, um, when I think of it compared to a standard Pathfinder Society scenario where it has to be written to be able to um, to be able to accommodate a wide variety of groups but if you know exactly what the characters are that are going to go into it you don't have to think about that variability right. you can write it specifically to those characters and you can construct the characters specifically to the interest so um let's see sebastian asks is there a good length for a one shot typically a lot of one shots play in about a four hour session like a standard pathfinder mm -hmm. society scenario but some are shorter some are a little bit longer because they know they're just one shot, and so they want to be, like, a pretty immersive experience. Kasuna, are you talking about wanting to play The Case of the Disappearing Wizards? Yeah. Uh, the one I think shot where, Kasuna may not yeah. know that you wrote a one oh, shot. That the one was shot where literally... everybody isn't familiar and they're all trying to rescue their masters? Yeah, that is a one shot that Linda literally Right. I assumed you were talking about that because that's no, literally it, exactly what it is. So you said a one shot rather than the one shot. Oh, so okay. I think it's sort of a thing I think people have talked about in various places, mm -hmm. but that uh, but that you actually wrote. Yeah, I thought you were literally talking about that. It was like, oh, yep. I would like my one shot. Anyway, yeah, I've uh, I, I've only run that for uh, psychic waves. Yes, that's uh, that's my kids' adventure. Yep, it's but for children. I could totally... It is a simplified pf2-esque rules that doesn't mean that that doesn't mean i couldn't run it for adults too though because because like, adults are just children in bigger clothes i mean just like don't expect it to be grimdark right <laughs> it's a pg slash g related adventure <laughs> <laughs> parental guidance there may be comic mischief there was there is indeed comic <laughs> mischief indeed yes uh <laughs> But yeah, I mean, you can do all sorts of stuff about having different characters. I mean, the idea for that one had initially come into my mind, in part because I had been thinking for a while that I wanted to do, and this didn't exactly end up being that, but that I wanted to do an adventure that takes place in a different scale. So an adventure where the characters were so small that, like, you use a huge miniature to represent something that's size medium or something like that. So you can do definitely do something along those lines, too where uh where you're you're acting on a different scale of a different scale of space a different scale of a different scale of um like cosmic importance too so like if you're if you're if you've been it's a great way to shake things up too like if your campaign's super high level and you're always like oh yeah you know in our group now we're we're worried about the fates of nations and we're doing all kinds of things and then you just want to kick back and be like, you know what? Let's all be level two characters dealing with some small town problems. Yep. And on the other hand, if you're usually playing a lower, lower scale thing, you could play super high level or do play a game of Myth Ender where your characters are all killing gods. Mm -hmm. That is literally the only thing that you do other than the build up towards killing gods and figuring out if something went wrong with the fact that you killed gods. But it is awesome, and it is a game that is designed around killing gods. <laughs> they all charge you into one shot where players played intelligent items when one too many players canceled after everyone was already at his place. They rolled random intelligent items and played. It was interesting. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> that sounds cool. And starts talking about um, the uh, stairs being a physical problem you need to solve. Yeah, it's a, a great chance to, to sh shift up what kind of things are obstacles and what kind of things are not. That's right. In Call of Cthulhu, being able to deal with, like, a door is a yeah. problem. that Like, one of the cat classes, its main thing is being good at opening doors and mm -hmm. levers and other things that humans 
usually could open very easily. Yeah, I got to play Call of Cthulhu at a convention once. It was fun. Which one? What type of cat were you? The one that climbs around? Yeah, the I was the I was the climby cat. I was climbing on everything. I definitely I definitely got distracted from the mission and I was spooling paper towels for a while. <laughs> but how were we gonna stop Hasper if you were just always unspooling paper towels? Well, I had to get the tension out because those annoying yappy dogs in the next room wouldn't stop barking. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> so, uh, the point is that one-shots uh, are even better for an ongoing group. Well, because I guess, to back up, you can use one-shots in almost any particular venue. We're talked about using them at conventions when we're mm -hmm. special guests. But you can use them with the same people you play your home group in as a palate cleanser. And when you do, switching it up is a great idea. Because you get something that's different... When you come back to the other game, it can just work a little better. Like, if you're playing a really grim dark game, and you do something a little light and a little bit less um, stressful, it can be a good palate cleanser. And so, doing something that's almost exactly the same as your other game, but just happens to be a one-shot, is usually not as effective. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Sebastian asks, are one-shots good for puzzles? Arguably, that is how the end of Serpent's Rise turns out. Yeah, one-shots can be a really great place for puzzles. Um, in part because you can go into it knowing that this is something where the players want to do puzzles. And then also in part because a puzzle and a one-shot can have elements that are just about discovering the fundamentals of the world. In a way that a puzzle, in, which can be really satisfying to piece together, in a way that a puzzle for an ongoing campaign can't necessarily do quite as well. Right. So like a Negnoresis, like I said, I don't want to spoil it because people might actually select to play it, but... It is basically a, um, a big puzzle while also like discovering and learning more and more about what's going on mm -hmm. uh, with the characters. And I was worried that for a one-shot there would be a problem if there was a puzzle because, well, it's got... Uh, it, it, it has a very specific time frame that you have to run it in. Mm -hmm. But somehow I managed so far, I think I ran it four times and it always managed to make it in on time because as the gm when someone is having an idea that's like going towards something and then they kind of skip over it and then someone's like, i don't think we tried everything like, what about that person's idea that they mm -hmm. said before so you could sort of like uh, oh, oh yeah we forgot about that yep so uh, i can sort of remind people uh, uh when they get distracted from something that would actually work Mm -hmm. um, but only if they're running behind on time. And if not, I can just let them Give just him. sort of meddle around with whatever they're going to do. So they actually work out better than you think if you have sort of a moderator, GM-type person there to um, to handle it, even if the whole thing is essentially a uh, an intricate puzzle. And I think, too, that, um, well, anytime you have a puzzle, making sure that there's more than one way to go about it, and then you have some kind of system in place to deliver hints as needed. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Plus, you want to have more going on than just the puzzle. Like, I was yeah. giving handouts and extra, extra facts and other things that people were dealing with in the midst of the puzzle. Does a one-shot GM have to be more flexible than your usual GM that plans to offer a written scenario or adventure? I would say not that necessarily. You might it really even be able to be the less flexible. Like, yeah, because if you have the care, if you know what the characters are, then you know that someone's not going to come in with some ability that you didn't know how it works. Because you, so you can plan how those character. abilities might interact with your your adventure in advance. And you also know how the at least theoretically like appropriately played versions of the mm -hmm. characters might interact with things. Like if you have Inigo Montoya as one of your characters and there's a six-fingered man who is the mm -hmm. one that he's hunting and they're not, like, messing up, you know that they're going to be like, my name is Inigo Montoya, you killed my father, prepare to die. Mm -hmm. um, like, you could expect them to do that, whereas if you don't know and you have that guy show up and just someone's playing, like, um, Dude Bro, the supposedly paladin of Aridin, mm -hmm. you're like, oh, great, there's a person with six fingers, all right, worship yeah. Aridin now. But I think that um, in one way that you do want to be more flexible is that in, um, in an ongoing campaign... 
if the players throw you a complete curveball and you just you realize you're going to need some time to reconstruct it, then it's easier to say, okay, yeah, you know, we're going to take a break and maybe we end the session a little early and then I'm going to figure this out in between. Whereas with a one shot, you're really looking to bring things forward into a satisfying conclusion. That so is you may need to true. you may need to move the pieces a little bit more in the background to make it work out. Uh huh. I recommend seeing it, Sebastian. You should see it. All <laughs> the coal people like that movie. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Let's see. So Joan. Have is... you played for a multiplayer one shot? If not, all the PCs end up getting played. Yeah, that one is. Very tough, Joe. Um, so, w if we go back to Maelstrom Rift, Linda came mm -hmm. up with a set of four and was like, these four need to be played. Mm -hmm. But the other two are optional. But it's a real yes. shame if you lose the two that are optional because they're some of the coolest, even if they're not the core. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I recommend having that sort of thing where you have... Um, you can also do it... Well, you had another one where... Um, where the, the the PCs are sort of in pairs, and I don't want to get into spoilers here, but the PCs are sort of in pairs, so you need to make sure that you want to make sure that the pairs who know each other are are there if they're if they're there, but like the pairs who know each other are together, but like you wouldn't necessarily so you wouldn't necessarily need to have every pair. Mm-hmm. That is definitely true. When it comes to uh... When it comes to my one shots, I can sometimes get a little bit purist and like really, really want to have every mm -hmm. character in it. But I definitely, for Twilight Bell, was worried about not having enough people. So I exactly did what Linda just said and made mm -hmm. three pairs of two. Mm -hmm. And so my goal, my plan was if five people showed up, one of them would have to play two characters. Mm -hmm. If four people showed up, I would just leave out one of the pairs. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was ready, and in Fighter Squad, everyone was just identical, so, except mm -hmm. for, no, they were, they were close, they were mostly mm -hmm. the same, so we just didn't have everyone for Fighter Squad, and so we just had four fighters instead of six. Yeah. if you're doing it for a convention game, I highly recommend making sure that, or a game that has to be at a certain time, I highly recommend making sure that it can scale, yeah. um, but if you're doing I'm pretty terrible, your... and I don't do that, and then I... I get wrecked every PaizoCon. Uh, stressing about this? Yes, you Stressing do. about it. And then, the, and then because, like, we're not allowed to communicate with the people who signed up for our game is because it's a privacy risk. So I can't, like, easily get access to mm -hmm. them to be like, uh, hey, um, it's said when you signed up that you need to fill out a questionnaire for your character so I can give it to you in advance. Mm -hmm. Um and make and make sure that everyone's coming and this constantly happens and then I wind and then up I getting, tell you you shouldn't run getting that back game up anymore. people and then I but I want to run the game. <laughs> um, and I, then we have this conversation where I'm like this stress. So is I I created more of them that work better with not everyone, but I really wouldn't want to run Unreality Incursion yeah. without all six characters because mm -hmm. of the fact that the whole thing if if you don't have like the devil and the demon then it's not that unlikely of a team because it's like an a lawful neutral outsider type yeah. person teams up with three celestials it's like okay that could happen mm -hmm. well there's a there's a an implied question in what sebastian is saying here what happens if um people uh have a debates or fights or arguments over who gets to play which character that can be rough usually I've had a lot of times when certain people knew which characters they wanted. It ha thankfully didn't overlap. And weirdly, Maelstrom Rift was not the only time that there was one person who was just like, I can't decide, I, mm -hmm. and honestly, you guys pick. I'll take the last one. And then that person wound up being the one who liked their character the best four times. So I've now mm -hmm. decided that the person who can't decide maybe that same personality type is one that can become enchanted by one-shot characters because I have four data points and mm -hmm. they all point towards that. I would say, um, I would say that, um, for convention games, I'd, for, for convention games, I'd often do first come, first serve. Um, whoever shows up at the table first gets to pick first. Um, and, um, I talk through some of the advantages of the characters until, um, so I've done this for kids, right? 
uh, where kids sometimes want to be the same character. And you talk through some of the advantages of, of them, and then you see who's getting most excited about which advantages, and then try to maybe make slight modifications to the character to to um, fit more with that with that person. If you if, as you're as you're talking to them, um, you can also have people roll off, um, or um, if you're making something for people you know. Um, tailoring the characters a little bit more to those players' interests so that you, you kind of expect which one this person's going to want to play more. Also, wow, it sounds like multiple groups had issues with people almost coming to blows about playing the, the Pyrasta in Maelstrom Rook. Because they, they all want to be the Pyrasta. Yep. Obviously that Pyrasta needs to return. Yes. Well, you know, the, um, you know, the concordance may not be a faction anymore, but it's that still out there in the world. doesn't mean a Pyrosta can't show up. No, I, I know, I know. Well, uh, but oh, I thought we were talking about that specific that, It doesn't mean that Pyrosta can't yeah, show Yeah, no, up. I'm saying that the, the concordance is still on, uh, still on good terms with the society, so. See, look, everybody's saying it. All right, all right. Um, but, but we would need Pyrosta rules, or we need to create them. We have to figure out if this is just a few people liking this Pyrasta a little bit, or if it's a real fandom. So, Dolok D Darkfur, or that Pyrasta whose name I forget, which one is a... Ember. A, a, Ember. Yes, Ember the Pyrasta. Which one? Uh, we'll see. <laughs> if Ember can it can be out popularity, um, Dolok Darkfur, then I think that that might do People it. We want you to write Pyrasta rules. Well, I can't just write Pyrosta rules. I would have to be able to convince people to put the Pyrosta into things. Mm -hmm. I've already suggested the Pyrosta before um, and had it, like, other people not be quite as enthusiastic as I am. Um, so. But I can always fine. create a Pyrosta and put it in a scenario. Yeah, you can. And then There's if you no want to pick it up to. in a bestiary, you can. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sebastian says that is rough because Dolok is on the splash page for the next PFS season. So yes, that's what I'm saying. If people can say that Ember is more popular than <laughs> uh, than than someone who's on the splash page for a season, then that would that would do it, I think. Um, so let's see. Anyway, Nicole uh, has a question about people who always want to do one shot player versus player games. Are there any advice for facilitating this in a way that doesn't let optimized PCs blow everyone else out of the water and maybe make it enjoyable for a variety of builds? Uh, fully understanding it wouldn't work so with all So I think it, it depends upon the ultimate goal. Like, it, do they want to do the PvP because they want to compete in the optimization Olympics? Because I know you did a one-shot a long time ago where people were doing that. So my group in back in 3.0 had a few different arena one-shots that we, that we did. And they were never really that great of an idea, and they always worked out like, eh, but they they basically had some sort of rules that the character, there was one where everyone was supposed to play a monster, but somebody convinced the GM to let them play just a, a wizard who was not a monster, and based on the way that the rules were set up, that was a big advantage, and the wizard just blew everything away um, who was a monster. Except for my character, who um, was dropped down to dropped down to zero in in like a Darth Vader outfit, and uh, my character, if actually seen, uh, would instantly kill you. But I had uh, there, there was a rule that I was not allowed to kill people before the fight started mm -hmm. during this pre-buff time that also vastly advantaged the wizard. So I wore like a Darth Vader outfit that mm -hmm. blocked it off, and then as a free action, I just. It was like tear away, it just went away at the beginning of the fight. And so I, at zero hit points, I was like, you have defeated me. Take off my mask. I just want to see you one last time <laughs> um, with my own eyes. And they thought it was funny because it was a Star Wars quote. So um, they took it off and then died. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's right. Obviously, that's what you need for a uh, PvP. Then there was another one that was a 2v2, but the two were both controlled by one person. That my, um, I want to say, like, so we were in high school at the time, and they just wanted to do a PvP 2v2 tournament. At that time, I was running the tournament, but everyone said they wanted to do it, and we were like, so my seven-year-old little brother, um, 
entered the tournament with a um, what appeared to be a dwarven wizard riding on a horse. And, it, and everyone was like, you used up the horse for one of your two characters? Because it will did say animal companions or any animal you brought was your other character. Mm -hmm. And it was actually... Uh, the the dwarf was like a super dwarven defendery character who could who had like the maximum hit points really really high in every save and could take hits for anything and the horse was a ridiculously uh overpowered uh i guess as twinked out as a seven-year-old could make wizard that could just polymorph anything into a small animal that would just die in mm -hmm. the current environment and so, the person who was playing a vampire beat everyone else, but then lost to to that. So, like, a lot of weird things happened in those tournaments. They probably were better than they could have. And mm -hmm. honestly, Pathfinder 2nd Edition is probably a little more balanced, because at 1st Edition, like, the DCs that that wizard had were not fair. I, that wasn't 1st Edition, sorry, that was 3.0. The DCs the wizard had were not fair or reasonable. They were so high that nobody could make Mm -hmm. The saving throw to be turned into a dying animal. Um, yes, bad horse. That's right. So uh, you can do it, but it's not the best. I'd say that you probably want to make sure that your group is at around the same level of optimization preference, and and set ground rules for what, and set ground rules for what sorts of things you can do. I can see like, I could see also doing something where if it's like picking monsters, it'd be like okay, yeah, you know. Pick a, pick a monster, like, pick a level whatever monster from this set or whatever and try it out. Yep. But you want to make sure that the players, like, have a general sense of how optimized they want to be and that they are at about the same level of system proficiency so it doesn't wind up just being something where the, where somebody who doesn't know the system as well feels like they're, they're being left out. Yes. And make sure everyone actually wants to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, when Lynn and I were at Gen Cob one year, we played in a sort of random fun tournament that was mostly just, you know, you're playing the game and you get points for solving riddles and doing things. But then at the finale, there was this giant PvP that mm -hmm. also had a dragon that you were fighting, but also PvPing, and you had been given goals at the beginning that were entirely solved by doing the PvP and were told mm -hmm. they were worth the most points. And the problem was that the group we were playing with as the ones we were fighting against were not only drastically less optimized than mm -hmm. our entire group, but also, like, at least one of those people did not want to be doing PvP. And we mm -hmm. didn't know when we signed up that even had a PvP component. So we didn't, like, have characters that were constructed assuming we were going to be doing PvP. And the GM was very sympathetic to the person who didn't want to be doing PvP and just made uh, capricious non-rules rulings of things mm -hmm. that happened to protect that person Which even though was really it was a pvp tournament because, that we were yeah. being scored on mm -hmm. so we had a zen archer with tons of poison on their arrows from my alchemist who had i had a goal that said i needed the zen archer to achieve their goal and their goal was to kill the one person who was complaining about mm -hmm. pvp and whose magical rulings would protect her mm -hmm. from whatever happened yeah <laughs> and then I had, like, a high int animal companion, and when my character dropped unconscious, I was like, oh, well, I assume that the GM would let me still play with my animal companion. But the GM's like, no, your animal companion wanders off. You can't do anything else. I think the GM just did not like us because yeah. our characters were clearly more optimized than the other groups. Yeah. So you need to... Uh, that GM may not also not have known it was going to be PvP in the final round mm -hmm. because they were... Part of the tournament was that the GMs were, did not know in advance exactly what yeah. was going to happen. Yeah, but I think that... I think that it's important to be sure for, from that, like, and that was just kind of a bad experience all but around. But it shows that, that those tournaments, that tournaments can, can be, lead to yeah. a bad experience. And I think that but, one thing to or do sorry, is... I mean make, PvP yeah. but, but, but what I'm going to say, what I'm going to say here, though, is that uh, making sure that you're absolutely being completely fair in your rulings because it, because otherwise it can come across as favoritism. And that absolutely was favoritism because it was. it was literally cheating. Literally, like, the rules work differently when one PC did something when, when the other PC did the same thing. But, um, also, an inexplicable thing happened that... that I have multi-attack. That, that was explained <laughs> by the multi-attack feat, which just reduces your penalties on your secondary attacks, mm -hmm. was, was explained to be able to do like this ridiculously overpowered thing that was to, to kill my character. Yep. The point is, it can be a lot of not fun, and that had been a 
pretty fun session up to the point where it mm-hmm. suddenly became that player versus player. So I don't really recommend player yeah, versus I player. Yeah, that was definitely a bad experience. And that's one of the few experiences I have with PvP. Um, but And I remember like we were all so frustrated walking around from that table that we were just like, I have multi-attack. Oh, and we had Se- to like cool off. Sebastian is wondering whether the Pathfinder Society special race for the Rune Carp key was player versus player. It wasn't, but it was a sort of players were being rated against players on a scaling, uh, on on a sort of scale of how many points they achieved at the table that was giving a lot of points for being bad Pathfinders um, in certain situations or sometimes for very questionable um, reasons. Mm-hmm. For, for example, there's a time when you need to blackmail someone and you can either find actual material to um, blackmail her with or make up lies. And if you find Mm -hmm. the real material and you make up lies, you get more points. But we found the real material. The GM said, do you want to also make up lies? And we were like, no, because if people figure out those are lies, that's going to undermine our real material. They'll think we Mm -hmm. somehow forged those documents to like the ones that we made up. It's much stronger to present only real evidence instead of evidence that is real mixed with lies but in terms of uh in terms of competition like maybe instead of an arena style thing you could do something where the pcs are uh where you have different pcs that are competing for an objective or like the pcs are doing a duel for example so it's not like a whole session that's all about like trying to kill each other it's something that has a it's something that has like a a formalized set of rules that are that are around it or like you know, the PCs are trying to compete to do a certain thing, um, to do a certain thing faster. Like oh, you know, we're trying to see who can who can be the fastest one to infiltrate this sort of thing. I could see doing something, for example, where you run, uh, where you have different teams that that try to compete against each other, and you run them in a different you run them in different times. Like where you have, all right, so you need to make a group to infiltrate this base, and then you run it for one for one table, and you run it for another table, and then like. You try to see how things go, but it, it's really tough um, because I mean I think a lot of these games at their core, because they're they're cooperative games, are, are made assuming that you um, are made assuming that you um, are all going to be working together, and are made to assume that if that characters can't do everything on their own, and they're going to have strengths and weaknesses. Mm-hmm. So I think it's a long-winded way to say that neither of us really recommends that, but if you want to do it, those are some general things to keep in mind. Mm-hmm. And as people are saying in chat, like, I'm very big on cooperative play, and that's why we even have episodes on collaborative or cooperative play. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I just really don't recommend going for player versus player, but... Mm-hmm. If you want to follow those tips. Now, if you want to do something that if you want to do something that has sort of a feel of fighting against PC type characters, one of the tropes that I see coming up that would be a fun one shot is the inverted dungeon, where mm-hmm. you're t- where you the players are taking the roles of the creatures in the dungeon that are trying to fight against a more stereotypical PC type party controlled by the players, or like where you're you guys are like some masterminds that are trying to direct your various exactly so like dungeon keeper yeah or the gm can control the pc yeah. group the and... GM, exactly that's what i meant the gm is controlling the pc group and the players are controlling the creatures that are yeah, trying you said to control by the players I, I i i said it wrong i said it wrong okay. what i what i meant is the is the dungeon keeper is the dungeon keeper style also if the... you're breaking up the gameplay a little bit of an ongoing campaign one funny thing you could do with that um is have the PCs who show up without telling your group have them be like definitely palette swaps of the of your group's usual characters, mm-hmm. and you can do some of their same same shticks that they normally do just as the NPCs who they're fighting. Like if someone is is character is like a super optimized archer who's super lone wolf style mm-hmm. character who's always um who has a, a super dark backstory, just make. And uh, an optimized archer who's a lone wolf style mm-hmm. character as a uh, as a tragic backstory who's just um so to sort of play up that. Oh, this reminds me of something though. One shots as a one shots as a tool for further developing your world. Mm-hmm. Um, like like when uh, like when a novel ha- or a TV show has a chapter or an episode that's from a different perspective, it can be really fun to have the players step into the role of different characters in the world who know about their PCs and have opinions on their PCs. 
So, like, I did a one-shot as a part of Kingmaker where the PCs were off doing something else, and so the the uh, the players took on the roles of various other people throughout the kingdom who were taking care of something. And they were, like, a lot of, the next best Yeah, the next best in the, piece, in the kingdom. So there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of banter there about um, about the P where they talked about their opinions of the PCs and they helped to shape these NPCs more. So I, I think that that can be that can be a lot of fun to give them a different angle into the world. Just like how it can be fun to have um, if you have multiple campaigns in the same world to have the PCs learn about each other and comment on each other. Because um, uh, my home group's been playing quite a few APs in in Galarian, so. They, they definitely have opinions of their own characters and each other's characters from other games. And sometimes they'll have events where it's like, oh, you know, the wizard swapping spells or like somebody comes and visits this other area and they meet up or things like that. So. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Mm hmm. Also, you can use. You can also use it to, uh, to set the scene for something that the PCs are going to do. Like if you want to. If the PCs are going to be coming into a town and then they're, they're like, maybe the PCs come into a town and they sort of solve a mystery and then you go back and you, and you see like, well, how did we get to this point? Or the, or the PCs are, or the PCs are sort of like, this is another interesting one that I've been thinking about, that I've been thinking about at some point, it'd be hard to put together, but like, where you sort of have a, uh, an adventure where you're, you're in part playing the past where, where the events are unfolding and you're in part playing the role of the future investigator. And I know Mark and I have talked about that, and you probably remember mm -hmm. a little better than I do the, how that conversation went, but. Mm-hmm. Yep. Also, another thing that you can do, um, too, that I've done twice as not exactly one shots because they were sort of ongoing campaigns mm -hmm. uh crossover episodes when I, when I had multiple ongoing campaigns uh two times i did crossover episodes where both of the campaigns would meet each other because in both cases a member of in one case a member of both campaigns had been kidnapped by the same balor mm -hmm. um and in the other case a member of both campaigns had been kidnapped by the shadow plane mm -hmm. uh in the second case, they weren't even from the same, like, cosmology. cosmology slash world. Whereas in the first case, they were both from the Forgotten Realms and the same battle or kidnapped both of the mm -hmm. PCs from different groups. Um, and so a crossover episode could be fun. And some of the players were the same in both groups and they just played both of their characters. Mm -hmm. The best part of my first... Oh my god, that the, fight. So Linda was in the second crossover. We have, like... 15 PCs and companion creatures. Yeah, it was a large fight. <laughs> the first crossover was definitely the funniest, though, because just like Linda said, you're going to wind up with a lot of characters. There were, like, 11, which is less than 15. Mm -hmm. But there should have been 12, because people didn't realize that um, Guzman the Necromancer had sent me a note at the beginning. He just never was there, and nobody missed his turn, mm -hmm. because... He was just played by a player who was very greedy, and the character was very greedy. Mm -hmm. And so he had spent his money buying a cart because <laughs> after his brother's character died during a fight where he was looting in the middle of the fight, and then um, he realized that he couldn't carry all of the chain mail off of the bandits they defeated because of his encumbrance, he was starting. His character burst into tears, not because his brother died, but because he couldn't carry all the chain mail. So he bought mm -hmm. a cart. He brought it to the abyss, and during the fight, he was looting the Balor's treasury the entire time, and <laughs> then he left. Yep. <laughs> and people are talking about, like, it's tough to... It can In a one-shot, you can off, do something like, like that. It can be tough to pull off uh, fights where you're supposed to lose at the end. I would say that, um... I would say that giving the PCs generally something that they are... Something that they're going for, some kind of objective, like... Um, trying to survive as, as many waves as you can. Or, like, you're trying to achieve a certain goal before... Uh, you're trying to hand off a particular piece of information to someone before you die yep. in this thing. Or you're trying to survive long enough to allow these people or to Or the escape. one Linda talked about yeah. where I just told them that they mm -hmm. just need to survive until reinforcements came yeah. from their friendly, definitely not traitorous mm -hmm. ally. And they were betrayed. Because they did last long enough that the reinforcements were supposed to be there and they didn't never showed up and they all yeah. died and went to Valhalla 
And, and when like, they came back to the mortal world, they also were able to not only help out with um, with some of the other problems that the gods needed the Iron Harry Air to check out, but also get some revenge mm-hmm. on the one who betrayed them. So if you play if you play it out that way too, and you're like, okay, you know, this is going to be a prologue to our story that helps to set the scene and shows you some information that's going to happen beforehand. I think people are talking about not getting in trouble from the one person who loads up all the treasure onto the cart. Yes. <laughs> I think people thought it was hilariously... In, in, when I, in the game I was running, people thought it was hilariously in character for that person mm-hmm. to steal all of the treasure. <laughs> yeah, prologue one-shots can be really cool. Um, also, cause... fiction uh, prologues are cool. There's actually a fiction prologue blog for Extinction Curse that's pretty cool. But... Yeah, prologue one-shots or even, like, prequel one-shots where you go back in time and see something from a different perspective. Just sort of shifting people's perspective and letting them find out more about the situation. And um, I saw talking about um, having a situation where um, a lot of players were working on the kingdom building rules, but there's a player who wasn't into it, so doing, like, a one-hour murder mystery for mm-hmm. that player. Yeah, you can absolutely have one-shots be, like, little little side mini events yeah absolutely plus sometimes one shots something you plan to be a one shot to give you a more of a perspective of the world gets too fleshed out and Mm -hmm. people want to have it as an ongoing campaign it becomes a spin-off rather Mm -hmm. than a one shot that sort of gives you a little bit more of a perspective joe probably wouldn't have liked the uh the time when they want to when our chaotic good exalted person stole one million gold from the party in our first campaign (laughs) <laughs> we deserved it we really did um anyway yeah playing as your enemy trying to see their point of view can be fun sebastian says and i saw some people before talking about like serpents rise and things like that where you have the two different uh, perspectives playing as the aspis agents and playing as the people trying to undo <laughs> yeah let's see Altar did one for Age of Ashes player. People, players play people lost in the mountains with amnesia from the town's history. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Healer Zero says playing as your enemy without knowing that is the best. You actually think from their point of view they're the heroes, and then you mm-hmm. find out that they're the enemies. That's pretty awesome, too. Yeah, totally. And you don't know until later on. It's like, wait a minute, we know those people. Oh, gosh. We played them in that one shot. Mm-hmm. And flashback scenes, um, someone earlier mentioned Final Fantasy VIII where you sort of take the roles of people from back in history or that happened before can be a great way to, um, you just, oh, just do this. It shows you a context from the past that you don't know what happened to that character and it could be that they're the villain now Mm -hmm. or all sorts of other possibilities. But you might be able to start piecing things together then from the clues that you see in the adventure about what may have happened Mm -hmm. and how that might be relevant to today. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Elftro is saying that that one shot also was a good, was sort of a demo and tutorial of Five Fighter Second Edition. Mm-hmm. All right. So. Do we have any more? Uh, we had a lot of great folks? questions yeah. today compared to some other days where we don't have as many questions, but we just have a, a lot of material. Yeah. Does anyone else have a, uh, more questions about one shots? Looks like new. No. Alrighty then. Um, in that case, shall we say, bye YouTube, see you next time.